Antonio's exciting talk, um, there is one advertisement to be made. <laughs> so we all need to fill in this list, um, which uh, decides our food phase for Friday. So uh, you need to choose when you want to have a lunchbox and if you want to have a lunchbox. So please come down, not now, but after the talk, before the coffee break, and uh, fill in this um, list. Just put it here. So then um, let's start with the next um, lecture. Tony Del Genio will talk about clouds and aerosols on Earth and Venus, which means we are paving on with clouds in planets. Okay. Thank you, Christian. Okay, so we're moving down in size now to smaller planets for the first time. And Daniel asked me to talk about Earth and Venus at, at our uh, meeting this week. And I realized that talking to an exoplanet audience, this slide, title slide that I had originally put together wasn't really ideal for the exoplanet audience. Uh, first of all, you're probably not used to dealing with planets that have actual names. So <laughs> I, so I made a slight change in the title. And, and <laughs> And, and then I realized you're not used to planets that are spatially resolved, so I made another change. So hopefully you're a little more, little more comfortable with this now, and you can just think, think of these in the way that you're more used to. Okay. And, uh, and <laughs> but, okay, now to the serious part of the talk. Uh, well, partly serious part of the talk. Uh, there's one other difference. Actually, in the program, Daniel had this listed as, as clouds and hazes. On, on Earth and Venus, and I wrote clouds and aerosols on Sol D and Sol, Sol D, Sol C, and there's actually a, a serious point that I want to make, and that is that we uh, in Earth science, and I should say, probably many of you don't know me, I've spent a lot of my career as an Earth scientist, but I, I was a planetary scientist early in my career and later in my career. And the last few years, I've, uh, I've spent part of my time uh, learning about exoplanets as well, and so, uh, Earth scientists do not use the word haze much at all. And I noticed that in your field, haze is the most common term for at least a part of the things that are suspended in the atmosphere. This is page one of chapter seven of the, of the last Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, Working Group One report. It's 88 pages long, and I did a search for the word haze in there, and it appears only once in 88 pages, and that's in the name of a cited reference. And so this large group of Earth scientists, apparently the word haze is a very foreign uh, thing to them. So that, that just points up this larger problem of what do we call all of these particles that are in the atmosphere that we like to talk about? And uh, you know, it, I think if, we, if we're actually going to promote this idea of Earth scientists and solar system scientists and uh, astrophysicists getting together, we do have to learn how to communicate with each other and, and understand how we each refer to things and if possible maybe even come up with some common usage for things. So this is actually one possible uh, terminology standard. It's mostly derived from something that Sarah Hurst published in the Planetary Society a couple of years ago. And I kind of liked it because it differentiates different kinds of things based on process of formation. And so we, we reserve the term cloud. Let's see, does this, this has a pointer too, right? It is, oops, I went back. I went. That one, okay. I thought I did that one, but no. Okay. Well, maybe we'll try the glove. Where we all check out. I'll use the glove. So, oh, that one works? Okay, I'll try that one. Thank you. Ah, but it may not work with this. Okay, I'll use, I'll use that to advance. Fine. Okay, I'm sure I'll get it confused. Yeah, yep. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so this terminology uses cloud for particles that are formed in the atmosphere for condensation of gases that are then cooled to their saturation uh, point. And then hazes are reserved for liquid or solid particles produced from 
chemistry in the atmosphere, and then we reserve the term dust for solid particles that are suspended in the atmosphere that did not originate in the atmosphere, that got kicked up from the atmosphere. And then aerosol is the term that Earth scientists like to use as sort of a ger generic term that includes both of these. Some people may like that, some people may not like it, but I'm going to try to stick to that in, in this talk, and it's at least worth a conversation as to, as to whether there's a common language we can all use. So by that language, that's dust, but it's not a cloud, even though Earth scientists sometimes call that a dust cloud. <laughs> okay, And that's also dust. That's the Opportunity rover on the surface of Mars, but it's not a cloud also by that definition. And then... That is a cloud, but it's not dust. And I don't know what you think the right name is for it. I see in some of the exoplanet literature, people use terms like mineral cloud and things like that. Uh, I promised Benjamin Charnay that even though I took this figure from his paper, I'm not accusing him of calling this a dust cloud. He did not call it a dust cloud in his paper. But, but it, it, it I remember the first time I read an exoplanet paper that had a dust cloud in it. I said, dust cloud? How come figure out that there's a dust cloud on a planet until I realized what it was you were all you were all talking about and I was very confused until that point so we, we, we need to work on some kind of common terminology whatever you think the best one is but it's it's worth it's worth doing and there will be a couple of other terms along the way that I'll try to remind you of uh, how we call things by different names from what you all uh, call things so we earth scientists care a lot about clouds they are absolutely integral to the energy cycle of planet Earth. They are a controlling factor for the Earth's albedo, and they have a very significant greenhouse effect, which is something that you rarely see mentioned in the planetary or exoplanet literature, but actually they're an important greenhouse agent on, uh, on our planet here. Naturally, they're essential for life. They deliver ocean water to the land surface. I mean, I, we have life in the ocean, obviously, too, but, but they deliver ocean water to the land surface, which is the only reason that life can exist here on the land surface. They are important in the ocean to the circulation of the ocean. The, er the ocean has two circulation components to it. One of them, the thermohaline circulation, is driven by salinity differences and therefore density differences from one place to another and those are caused by the amount of fresh water entering the ocean and the amount of water evaporating from the ocean in other places and uh, as far as understanding what's going to happen to our planet in the 20th century clouds are central to the debate over how fast and how much the earth is warming up and going to warm up in the future. They are the largest uncertainty other than human beings ourselves. Obviously, the biggest uncertainty in 21st century climate change is what are we going to do? That's something you can't predict with a model very well. But, but once you make an assumption about what human beings are going to do, then it turns out clouds are the biggest reason why different model predictions of the future disagree to, uh, to some extent. And also, clouds are a beautiful tracer of the dynamics of the atmosphere. And just watching movies of, of the Earth uh, can just teach you a lot of basic stuff about the general circulation of Earth's atmosphere. So I, I thought about that and, you know, and tried to compare it to why exoplanet scientists care about clouds. And uh, <laughs> this seems to be the main thing that you're all, you're all concerned with. <laughs> uh, I, I was very struck by this headline in the register a few months ago when the paper on WASP-96b uh, came out. And they referred to this as the first perfect exoplanet because it didn't have any clouds. <laughs> and, and well. You know, <laughs> do you think you're a co-author of that paper, aren't you? Where, aren't you a co-author in that paper? No, okay, I thought you were. <laughs> anyway, I don't know whether whether that's your definition of a perfect exoplanet. I know you don't like flat spectra, but uh, but anyway, uh, uh, but I think we're starting to actually to get to the point, at least in exoplanet science, that beyond the difficulty that clouds present to all of you who are just trying to, to detect uh, gases and things on, on uh, exoplanets that, that we're starting to get to the point in our thinking about exoplanet w planets where we are worrying about the, the climate and circulation of these planets as, as well to get a more fundamental understanding of what's going on there. And, and so clouds actually are a part of that. And so I think slowly but surely the exoplanet field is is going to start start picking up on some of these things that uh, we think on on Earth are 
uh, important for clouds and start thinking about them more in the context of just the science of exoplanets rather than the detectability of the features that you'd all like to look at. So uh, let's imagine that uh, you are an exoplanet scientist, not, not a scientist who studies exoplanets, a scientist living on an exoplanet. Let's say you're an astronomer on, I don't know, TRAPPIST-1e. Does TRAPPIST-1e, uh, does Earth transit the sun from TRAPPIST-1e? I know it's far away, but <laughs> let's imagine, let's imagine that it does. And you've just, huh? Yeah, right, because yeah, it's so far away, but, right, but, but let's imagine you're lucky and, and the Earth transits the sun. You've just discovered the Earth and also, and so you've been able to, to, uh, to get a spectrum and you found water there and somehow you've, somehow you've, from the water that you can see up there, you've made some brilliant guess as to how much water there is down at the surface and you've gotten the right answer. And so you're able to uh, make this nice condensation curve the way we've seen several times this week and figure out where's the water going to condense on Earth. And you find out that the water is going to condense on, out, uh, on Earth just barely above the surface at around maybe 500 meters altitude. And you say, wow, what a planet this is. There's got to be this, you don't have to do anything to get water to condense it. Condense it comes comes out right right after you get the water up above the surface. This must be a planet that's shrouded in these water clouds and you know, sort of think like a whole planet that's like Seattle or London in the winter, okay? And uh <laughs> <laughs> Vicky Vic, Vicky, I, I would not have said that were it not for the fact that Vicky admitted this at breakfast this morning. <laughs> 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 And so, you know, maybe a little blue tint from the Rayleigh scattering, I don't know, of the air or the air above the clouds, but but you know, but this is but this is the this is the depiction of Earth that would run in all of the news services on Trappist one E about the planet that they had just discovered, right? <laughs> you know, so uh, and of course what does uh, Earth really look like? So this is not an image of the Earth, this is a vertical versus latitude distribution of where the clouds actually are on Earth as seen by a combination of the CloudSat radar instrument and Calypso LIDAR instrument that are currently in orbit around the Earth. And it's beautiful having a radar and a LIDAR in orbit around the Earth so that we can actually see through the full complement of clouds and get the, get the true vertical structure. So I am so looking forward to the first exocloud radar, but I, I, I hear that it's a few years away. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, anyway, we're very fortunate here on Earth now to be getting these active remote sensing instruments that can tell us about the vertical structure. And what you see is there are places on Earth where the condensation temperature prediction does a pretty good job of telling you where the cloud base is going to be. In particular, in the middle and higher latitudes, that is, that is sort of where the peak in the cloud distribution uh, is. They're not there all the time. These frequencies are about 50, 60 percent at their at their tops, but it, yeah, but it does pretty well of locating where the cloud base uh, should be. And but then when you go to the kind of 60 to 70 percent of the Earth that is equatorward of about say 50 degree latitude, then the situation gets more dicey. So there is still basically a cloud base, a few hundred meters uh, above the surface, but you can see the frequency of occurrence is very small, only about say 20 percent on average. And then there's this other peak way up in the troposphere that doesn't seem to be related much at all to, to this idea of a low cloud base. So you know, what's, what's doing with these and can we learn something from meteorology on Earth to understand why the Earth's clouds are distributed in the way they are? So one hypothesis for why the clouds are where they are, and that is that clouds nucleate onto other particles, what we'll call aerosol particles, hazes or dust or whatever in the atmosphere. And so you might expect the clouds to preferentially form where you've got lots of aerosols. And so this is the distribution of aerosols on the Earth. And there's lots of sulfate, basically sulfate, nitrate, black carbon, organic carbon. Most of this is anthropogenic. So if you would come by the Earth back in 1750 or something like that, these things would look very different. There are natural sources of these uh, aerosols, but the, the vast amount of the aerosol material in the atmosphere for these four types of aerosol is anthropogenic 
in nature and you can see that a lot of it is heavily weighted toward the northern hemisphere which is much more industrialized and has much more land to begin with organic carbon a little less so has a has a has peaks in the northern hemisphere but also has large peaks in the tropics due to biomass burning and the same is true of, of black carbon really the only difference between black carbon and organic uh, carbon is apparently the completeness of combustion uh, the climate people care about the difference for another reason because these are very high single scattering albedo aerosols and these are low single scattering albedo aerosols so they play different roles in the climate and then you've got dust which is basically a natural uh, aerosol in the atmosphere and and Africa is the, the world's capital of of dust in the atmosphere as well as one of the capitals of biomass burning in the atmosphere and then you have sea salt uh, which there's a decent amount of it in the southern hemisphere but overall when you put all of these things together <coughs> there is a lot more aerosol in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere and as I say, there's more aerosol in Africa than any place else on the planet. And so one hypothesis is that then the clouds will form where these aerosol peaks are, right? So where do clouds form? And you know, if you just take a look at a satellite image of the Earth, it doesn't look much like that distribution of aerosols. In particular, uh, Africa may be the aerosol capital of the world, northern Africa, but it sure isn't the cloud capital of the world because most of it is the Sahara Desert. And uh, the Southern Ocean, which is about the cleanest place on Earth this side of Antarctica, let's say, the, the Southern Ocean is, is very clean compared to most of the Northern Hemisphere and the Northern Oceans, but its cloudiness is every bit as, as prevalent as in the uh, Northern Hemisphere Oceans. The big difference that aerosols make on Earth is that they, the, the cloud condensation nucleus or CCN concentration. I don't know if that's a, a term that you use yet in exoplanet science, but, uh, but that's one that we use in Earth science. That regulates the droplet number and the size of the aerosol particles. The size then affects their reflective properties, their albedo, the droplet number may affect their tendency to precipitate. All right, but the existence of clouds, the formation of clouds on Earth is not aerosol limited because every place on Earth has enough aerosol to at least get it going. So, th that's, so that's different from some of the situations that you might encounter on some exoplanets where you may be relatively depleted in the things that you need to act as seeds for, for cloud formation. On Earth, that's not the case. So in the pre-industrial era, pre era, the, uh, the, the aerosol concentrations were dramatically lower than they were today. Uh, we did some work back oh, 15, 20 years ago when we were first putting aerosol effects into our GCM to see what, what kind of an effect they would have on cloud albedo. And there are lots of free parameters that you can change to, to try to, to change the result. And the, the one that we found that had the biggest effect on the climate was how efficiently uh, aerosols falling out of the bases of clouds as precipitation washed other aerosols or scavenged other aerosols out of the atmosphere and cleaned up the atmosphere. And the problem is when you make that too efficient, the pre-industrial aerosol, pre aerosol concentration, which is already very low compared to, to today's aerosol concentration, becomes unbelievably low that you've sort of like got, you know, one boulder sized droplet per grid box in your GCM or something like that because you've, you've just washed everything <laughs> out and the number of concentration goes, goes down so low. So we realized that that's really a sticking point for GCMs trying to simulate the effect of aerosols on clouds and the albedo clouds. Uh, I can tell you a dirty little secret and that is that uh, it is entirely possible with, a, with an Earth GCM trying to simulate the 21st century record of climate change to predict, quote unquote, in, in, or in a hindcast, that the, 20, the last half of the 20th century did not even warm up. And you do that if you make your aerosols a little bit too good at regulating uh, cloud droplet size uh, so that the clouds get very, very bright over, over the part of the 20th century when, when there was the most anthropogenic emission of aerosols. So this is a, a really big uncertainty in climate model projections today.
but the pre but but to come back to your original question, the pre-industrial atmosphere was much much cleaner. <laughs> you can still identify. That's one of the things that people always imagine. Could you identify some place on the Earth that was really pre-industrial in nature? The Southern Ocean is sort of as close as we can. Antarctica maybe as close as we can. You can't find any place over the over the rest of the land surface of the Earth where you don't have have some contamination from anthropogenic aerosols anymore. Not, not in most of the atmosphere. That might be a good lead into my next slide. There's one place where things are different, and that's the upper troposphere of the Earth. Okay, so so uh, <coughs> most of our atmosphere, lower atmosphere is pretty wet. We have a relative humidity or saturation ratio of 0 0.8, 0 0.9, or something like that over most of most of the air that we walk through on a, on a time average, uh, although it does vary in time with the weather, as you go up into the upper troposphere, the relative humidity climatologically decreases to relatively low levels by comparison, 50 to 60 percent relative to saturation with respect to ice, okay, because we're at temperatures here that are certainly cold enough to make ice. But despite the fact that the relative humidity is relatively low up here, you can watch the relative humidity of the upper troposphere as a function of time. This is at 215 hectopascals or millibars, which is a little bit below the tropopause. And uh, this is from an experiment called the microwave limb sounder, which can, can retrieve uh, t uh, temperatures and humidities. And they find that in some places, especially in the equatorial region, 20, 15, 20, 25 percent of the time the air is supersaturated and we know that with respect to ice and we know that it can get as supersaturated as 30 percent 40 percent sometimes at even colder temperatures 50 or 60 percent supersaturated with respect to ice and there are a few different reasons for that one is that the upper trop troposphere is just a lot cleaner than the lower troposphere because most of the sources of aerosols on earth are from the surface Okay, and so they have to be transported up to the upper troposphere. There's not a whole lot of production of aerosols in the upper troposphere on Earth. And only certain types of particles, so, so lots of things can serve as cloud condensation nuclei for liquid droplets, but only certain things can serve as effective ice nuclei for the, for the formation of ice crystals. And I believe that's because ice has a defined crystal lattice shape and it needs to be compatible with the boundary of the particle that it's glomming onto and if it's not then it just decides not to that's I, i'm not a microphysicist you can see <laughs> so you have probably have a, an accurate explanation for that but but uh, but it has to do with incompatibility between the shape of the ice crystal and the shape of the particle that it is that it is trying to form onto as a result a lot of the aerosol that does get up into the upper troposphere does not effectively serve as ice nuclei uh, things that do serve are uh, dust and biogenic particles, uh, surprisingly enough, uh, people are finding out in recent years seem to be effective ice nuclei. Uh, and then the other reason why you get supersaturation, so, so those, that explains why, why sometimes you can get supersaturation because the right particles to do it aren't around, but also the reason you can get supersaturation is that the upper troposphere has episodic large injections of water vapor into the atmosphere due to convective storms. And if you look at the distribution of the high frequencies of supersaturation, all of the high frequencies of supersaturation in the upper troposphere are over the major convective, deep convective storm regions. And so that's a documentable phenomenon that, that, that non-negligible supersaturations with respect to ice can occur. What these never do is to get above water saturation, either pure water saturation or the saturation level of a, of a sulfate solution in water, which can, be, which can, can bring the supersaturation even higher. But with respect to ice saturation, definitely occurs, and it's measurable by satellite, which I, I thought that was a really neat result when that came out. I love that. So I believe what you called the saturation ratio, right? So it's the ratio of the actual vapor pressure of the water to the saturation vapor pressure as given by the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. Okay, so 100% relative humidity means saturation. Right, another, 
to remind ourselves of all the terminologies that are that are different. <laughs> okay, so so uh, why are parts of the Earth cloudy and parts not cloudy, and why do some have extensive cloudiness and others have patchy, uh, partial? cloudiness. And so on the Earth, it's pretty clear that it's the dynamics of the atmosphere that is driven by the equator to pole temperature contrast, or maybe more, more fundamentally, the equator to pole radiative heating cooling contrast between low latitudes and high latitudes. We know that at low latitudes, more sunlight enters the atmosphere than there is thermal radiation emitted to space. So there is a net energy surplus in the low latitudes. We know that at high latitudes, there's more thermal energy emitted to space than there is sunlight absorbed by the planet. So there's a deficit of radiative heating in the high latitudes. In response to that surplus versus deficit, there are only two possibilities. Either the Earth's tropics are systematically warming up with time and the Earth's polar regions are systematically cooling with time, or the Earth's system is finding a way to transport the excess heat from the low latitudes to the high latitudes to make up the difference in the source sink uh, distribution. And of course, it's the latter. The atmosphere transports heat poleward. The ocean also, by the way, transports heat poleward. But in the atmosphere, the, uh, uh, the atmosphere transports heat, heat poleward by weather systems. So here are two cross sections. Here's one going from the Arctic out over the Pacific Ocean in mid-latitudes. And over this cross section, you have these mid-latitude baroclinic uh, storms, uh, low, f low pressure centers, cold fronts, warm fronts, the types of things you're used to seeing on a weather map if you live in these latitudes of the world. And where you have air moving poleward and upward, you're making these large cloud decks that are, that are the ones that really look the closest to what you'd imagine from the condensation uh, profile. Okay, but then what goes up must come down someplace else, and behind a cold front where air starts to come down and brings drier air down from higher altitudes, then you're producing very low saturation ratios, low relative humidities behind uh, the cold front, and, uh, and so therefore you're going to get cloudy places and you're going to get uh, clear places. But that's the primary way that the Earth transports heat poleward in this part of the world. If you go to the lower latitude part of the atmosphere, there are still heat transport processes going on, but different phenomena doing that. And so if you go from the coast of Southern California out over the ocean down to the equator, then you go through several different cloud regimes, all associated with this large overturning circulation in Earth's atmosphere called the Hadley cell, which has rising motion near the equator, a place where there are frequent, very deep, heavily raining convective storms. Those things rise up to about the tropopause. They then uh, detrain or spit out their water vapor and whatever ice crystals have not fallen out of the atmosphere. And those go out into the atmosphere, moisten the upper troposphere. That air drifts poleward. Eventually, it begins to subside when you get to the subtropics. And that brings drier air down into these regions. And, uh, and so you get very little cloud formation in this part of the subtropics, but at very low levels where the atmosphere starts to feel the effect of the surface, you start to form these low-level cloud layers and close to the California coast. And you have something similar, by the way, in the Atlantic Ocean. So if you uh, are from this part of the world and you take a trip to uh, Portugal and go out uh, to the Azores, you'll see these same types of, of clouds, stratocumulus clouds forming near the Azores. And uh, then as you go farther out over warmer water, the, they change type. They change from these overcast clouds to these more spotty, uh, shallow convective clouds that have a very small cloud cover. So I wanted to, to talk a little bit about these clouds and, and these clouds because I think they're of some interest for this question of, of detectability of features on, on certain types of planets. So here's a, actually a mosaic of several satellite images uh, these things are just gaps between the individual images from the from the MODIS instrument, which is on board two satellites uh, right now in Earth orbit. And here's the California coast, and here is the the stratocumulus deck off the California coast. And this is like, an example of the low-level water cloud that is predicted well by the condensation temperature. So if you ever go to the beach in Southern California, 
in, say, July and you go out to the beach at 10 o'clock in the morning looking for nice sunny weather, often what you actually find is it's overcast. But if you just hang around for a couple of hours, the sun burns off the clouds and then all of a sudden things clear up. Well, that's the stratus stratus cumulus cloud that has impinged on the beach and the and land for a little bit, uh, but mostly it's located over the ocean here. And so that's, that's the one that you'd predict from the simple thermodynamic arguments, but then you go out another 500 to 1,000 kilometers and most of those clouds have disappeared. You have this much more patchy, shallow cumulus uh, region. And so what's the difference between here and here? The differences are not dramatic. They're very subtle differences between this very cloudy place where you can't see down to the surface much at all and this place where you can see down to the surface quite a bit. And, uh, and here's what the difference is. And it's, if you've ever seen these strata cumulus clouds, they're the, they're the wimpiest looking clouds you can, you can imagine. They're just, they're just kind of sitting there apparently doing nothing. But it's all an optical illusion because there's this really interesting physics going on inside these clouds. So this is a figure from a, uh, from a review paper by, by Rob Wood. Who's an, who's an expert on strata cumulus clouds and uh, showing what's actually going on. If you're, let's say, this is, this is the kind that's just off the coast of California and uh, the, the water is pretty cold by the standards of the latitude that Southern California is at. Uh, the, the water is pretty cold there and as a result, the evaporation of water from the surface and the, the s what's called the sensible heat flux, that is the, the turbulent transfer of, the, of temperature differences between the ocean and the air adjacent to it into the ocean, which, which warms things up and the evaporation, which moistens this air, is relatively weak compared to what it is over warmer oceans. And about a kilometer up, even less, there is a very strong temperature inversion here that, that is an either an increase in temperature or an, I or an increase in another quantity called potential temperature, which, which indicates how stable the atmosphere is against vertical motions. And above this, the air is bone dry most of the time. And so the, uh, whatever turbulence you get is barely able to form this, this little cloud below the inversion layer. And then once it forms, something funny happens. People just assume that, that, that you have a turbulent boundary layer of the atmosphere in, con in uh, contact with the ocean, and that turbulence is all driven by heating from the surface. But what happens in a stratocumulus cloud is different. Once this cloud forms, then it becomes a radiative process. So it's warm down here compared to up there. You have thermal radiation being emitted upward. The thermal radiation hits the base of the cloud. The cloud is opaque to the thermal radiation, and so the thermal radiation gets absorbed at the base of the cloud, warming it, and thermal radiation does not pass through the cloud very well because of its opacity, so the upward thermal flux through the cloud is very small. Then you get to the top of the cloud, and all of a sudden it sees dry, non-cloudy air above, and all of a sudden the long wave flux or I know there's another term, long wave and short wave. That's another one that, that you don't use. So we use short wave to indicate solar radiation, uh, the wavelengths of solar radiation, and long wave to indicate the wavelengths of uh, a planet's own emission. So what you would call thermal emission is what we would call long wave uh, radiation. And uh, so you have very little thermal flux up to the top of the cloud and then a large thermal flux once you get uh, up above the top of the cloud, so therefore there is a divergence of the thermal flux across the cloud top. D flux dz is positive, and if you look at the thermodynamic energy equation and the effect of D flux dz positive, that is a cooling term, and so you get tremendous cooling of the air due to this divergence of the thermal flux at the cloud top. That cool air then becomes negatively buoyant, and as all these little red arrows indicate, you start creating little turbulent eddies that drop into the cloud from the dry air above. They drop into the cloud, they encounter some of the droplets that are in there, they start evaporating the water in those droplets, they become even cooler, even denser, even more negatively buoyant. All of a sudden, the whole thing is developing a big turbulence layer that goes through the whole cloud all the way down to the surface, and it's all being driven from up here by the divergence of the thermal flux, not from below by the, 
by the convective flux from, from below. And so it's a, it's a very unusual type of cloud. This is a very difficult type of cloud for general circulation models to, uh, to represent, but it's a very important cloud in our atmosphere. Now that's what happens off the coast of California where the ocean is cool and the inversion is strong. Uh, you move 500, 1,000 kilometers out over an ocean that is now a little bit warmer, not hot, but a little bit warmer, and the inversion is getting a little bit weaker, and all of a sudden now the evaporation of water from the ocean surface starts to assert itself a little bit more, and you start to get some uh, turbulence that is driven from the surface, forming little shallow convective eddies and cells that make their own clouds. These things pop up into the layer where the strata cumulus cloud is. The turbulence driven by the radiation at the cloud top is still there, but now it's in a battle with the turbulence that's being driven by the, by, uh, uh, by the convection coming up from below. And so you have this turbulence that's trying to do one thing, this turbulence that's trying to do something else. Where they meet, since this air is in general warmer in some sense than the air down here, you form a little extra little inversion layer right here in the middle called a decoupling level. And once you form that decoupling level, that acts as a barrier for these clouds. And these clouds, the turbulence now can no longer extend all the way down to the surface anymore. And that's where they pick up their water to maintain themselves when they're in this configuration. So you cut off their supply of the water. And once you do that, these clouds die out. The shallow convective clouds start to pop up and clear spots start to form between the clouds. And before you know it, uh, all of a sudden the strata cumulus deck has gone away and you've got all these strata cumulus clouds. And it's all fairly predictable. It's not easy to simulate in a model, but it is fairly predictable once you know that there's a transition from a cooler ocean with a stronger inversion to a somewhat warmer ocean with a weaker inversion. You get this dramatic change in the cloud regime from almost overcast to very scattered cloudiness. Uh, if those are the only clouds on Earth, then, then the exoplanet astronomer doing direct imaging of, of the Earth would be thanking their lucky stars that this occurs because this would allow you to see down to the surface where this never would. We make something like this in GCMs. We, this is an Earth GCM that we've applied to. We call it Proxima Centauri b, but you know who knows what so Proxima Centauri b even is, if it even is. Uh, think of it more of as a generic, tidally locked, synchronously rotating terrestrial planet. Okay, this particular one is an all-ocean planet, and uh, and so these are two different flavors of this simulation. Th this is looking at the cloud fraction and occurrence uh, using our Earth GCM, but just adapted to do other planets. And so this is essentially the vertical dimension, and this is longitude along the equator from the uh, substellar point, that's what that is, to the antistellar point in the middle and back to the substellar point. You can see the different clouds that form. And the, the, the types of cloud profile that you get on such planets going from the substellar point to the antistellar point bears some resemblance to the cloud distribution that you get on Earth going from Earth's tropics to Earth's subtropics with an overturning circulation that has rising motion at the substellar point and then uh, air drifting toward the uh, antistellar point, sinking there, forming an inversion layer there, and then with a return flow. It's a little more complicated than that, but, but you get that. Anyway, uh, so this looks something like my, my diagram before of the, of the equatorial region to the coast of California. Uh, this, are, this is two different versions of, of this planet. This one uses the reported uh, installation value for Proxima, Proxima Centauri, which is 0.65 times the amount of insulation that the Earth receives from the sun. So it's, it's going to be a cooler planet than, than the Earth is. And for this one, though, we gave it a, a, a one bar pure carbon dioxide atmosphere, carbon dioxide being a strong greenhouse gas produces fairly warm temperatures. This is an all-ocean planet. Even though it's only getting 65% the sunlight that Earth is getting, uh, its ocean remains liquid all around the planet, including on the day side and the night side of the planet. 
this is a different simulation, still a one bar atmosphere, but now this is a nitrogen atmosphere, but with just a little bit of carbon dioxide, about equivalent to what's in Earth's atmosphere today. Yeah, Vivian. Yeah, I, so you can initialize it in many ways. We usually just, so we've tried initiali uh, initializing it with just an Earth modern climate, which, uh, which starts with water in the atmosphere. But uh, people worry about the sensitivity of these results to the initial conditions that, that, you, uh, that you simulate. Uh, and so we did, a, we did a simulation in which we first did another run where we, where we cut the installation in half from 65% what Earth gets to 32% what Earth gets. And we ran that to equilibrium. And then we use that as an initial condition. That planet is very cold with hardly any water vapor in the atmosphere at all. And when we take that atmosphere and then move it back to the original uh, installation, it reproduces the, the answer that we got before. So in this particular case, it's not sensitive to, to how we initialize the planet. But there are other cases where these models can be sensitive to how you initialize the planet. You can get bistable behavior. Tad, you have. So, so, so there's this paper uh, by uh, Jade Chaclair and uh, Dorian and uh, Kristen Manu and, and Dorian Abbott suggesting that because of the shape of the insulation uh, function uh, near the substellar point, those model those types of planets are not prone to to having this bistable behavior, whereas G star planets that are not in tidal AI configurations would be. I will have to say I can't give you a, a, a comprehensive answer to that, but in the few cases that we've seen, we've not been able to get bistable behavior with this type of planet. We have, especially with high obliquity values, been able to get bistable behavior with a regular Earth type atmosphere. Plus whatever, plus whatever water vapor is there. That's, that's correct. That's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're right. So it starts out with some water vapor in the atmosphere, but a very modest amount. Yep. And uh, so, so this was the other simulation I was talking about where this is an N2 atmosphere with only a little bit of CO2. And again, we've reduced this uh, solar constant or stellar constant, if you want to call it, to 32% the value that the Earth gets from, from the sun. And we ran both of these to equilibrium. So this very cold planet is a complete snowball, more or less. And uh, what it forms on the day side in the subsiding branch of the day-night circulation is this kind of stratocumulusing looking layer. I highly doubt that it has all the physics in it that I just described to you that real stratocumulus clouds do. Uh, but, but it has something that looks like that. This one in the much warmer atmosphere with a warmer ocean underneath it is producing this partial cloud cover with these deeper but more patchy clouds that are definite. And these we know are shallow cumulus clouds because we actually can directly diagnose the occurrence of convection. So, so this model actually does something similar to what the Earth's subtropics actually uh, uh, do. And uh, you know, take that for what it's worth, but it's, uh, it's an example of, of this process in, in action. Okay, and then we get to the stuff really near the equator on Earth, the deep convective stuff. And, uh, and these are a different animal from, from everything else. And the concern about deep convection is that uh, it goes all the way up to the tropopause. Sometimes it penetrates the tropopause and injects water into the stratosphere. And it's not well predicted just by looking at what fraction of the troposphere is unstable. And so this is a diagram of a quantity called the moist static energy. And it's the specific heat at constant pressure times temperature plus gravity times altitude plus the latent heat of condensation times the saturation point concentration of water vapor in the atmosphere. And the reason why meteorologists creates some funny looking quantity like moist static energy is because it's approximately conserved in the lifting of moist saturated air. So it's a very useful concept to use. And so this diagram over here indicates that if I started with a parcel of air that had 
a value of this saturation moist static energy with this value and I lifted it up it would get up here and have exactly the same value and so you it's very easy to predict what its uh, properties are going to be at the cloud top and the other thing that it's useful for is that if the parcel that you're lifting has a saturation moist has a, has a moist static energy greater than the saturation moist static energy of the atmosphere it's unstable to moist convection and will make this type of a storm it is only unstable so and what this and in somewhat simpler language for those of you who who've done a little bit of meteorology when this quantity h star decreases upward that is the same as saying that the lapse rate of the atmosphere the rate at which temperature decreases upward in the atmosphere is in excess of the moist adiabatic lapse rate so if you've heard of the moist adiabatic lapse rate that that's an indicator of a, an atmosphere that is prone to make convection as long as it can can be triggered the instability only goes as far as the mid troposphere but the convection bypasses the layer of instability and goes about twice as far up so instead of being let's say one scale height deep it winds up being two scale heights deep because it retains its buoyancy even when it gets to the top of the of the uh, uh, convectively unstable layer so this behavior of deep convection is somewhat different from the behavior of dry convective turbulence which is more or less restricted to the range of altitudes where the profile itself is unstable moist convection goes well beyond the unstable layer to someplace much higher up and forms this cloud at the top so if you are an astronomer looking for a planet where you're going to to, to look for a water vapor line uh, this is the, th the thing that's going to get in your way and you have to hope that it doesn't completely get in your way and prevent you from from detecting the the gases that you want to to detect um, the other thing to note about it is that it has properties very different from the, the other types of clouds in Earth's atmosphere uh, that that are more controlled by, by microphysical processes in that the, the most of the condensed water is in the top part, not in the bottom part, rather than having a, mix, a maximum down here gradually decreasing upward the way many other clouds do. These types of clouds are top heavy and have most of the, most of the stuff in the top of the cloud. And because there are these vigorous dynamical phenomena, again, what goes up has to come down someplace else and what comes down is adjacent to the cloud and partly adjacent to the cloud and so they also have have partial cloud cover so the partial cloud cover is their saving grace if you're an exoplanet person trying to detect gases on a planet with such clouds but this is the part that's the bane of the astronomer trying to to detect those uh those clouds and so uh you know the question is you, you can do this prediction fairly easy and the question is whether there's some way to to diagnose the existence of the possible existence of these clouds on some of the planets that we look lo look at and and anticipate whether whether the cloud tops in certain situations might be higher than we imagine them to be but that's a maybe a discussion for another day okay so So even in Earth's atmosphere, it doesn't cover everything, right? So if you look at a satellite image of the Earth, you can clearly see those big anvil clouds, not the convective clouds themselves, which cover a small area. You can clearly see these big anvil clouds making this big band of cloudiness around the Earth called the intertropical convergence zone. But there are gaps between those clouds, and there are days that are clear and days that are cloudy, and it's not constant cloudiness. I think one of our bigger questions is whether it's possible in a configuration that gets more consistent forcing of convection to actually get a cloud shield that, that covers the whole thing. I'll tell you that GCMs today that are being applied to these synchronously rotating planets with water are making these cloud shields on the day side of the planet where the convection itself is, is intermittent and sporadic. It's only occurring maybe 10, 20 percent of the time, but then it's making these bigger uh, anvil clouds that are hanging around a lot larger fraction of the time. That is certainly one of the TBD things uh, for the future. Uh, the, 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 the problem, I think, that I see is that we are, we've had now, now had a few different models, at least three, if not four or five different general circulation models that are successful in making that type of cloud, either for synchronously rotating planets or slowly rotating planets, 
and it's gotten to the point now where people are just sort of accepting that these things exist. And I always try to remind people it would be nice if we actually discovered one first <laughs> and saw that it was actually possible to have this kind of entire cloud shield that, that, would, that would cover one whole part of the planet. That may turn out to be true. That may not turn out to be true. So the, so the latent heating is, is important in sustaining the buoyancy of the cloud and allowing it to get that far. The, reason, the whole reason that it tops out where it does is, is eventually up here you get to the tropopause, and then above the tropopause the air becomes very statically stable, and it can't go much farther than that. If it retains some vertical momentum when it reaches the tropopause, it may punch up and overshoot a couple of kilometers, but that's about all. So it winds up being that high because of, of the stratosphere on Earth, which is in effect an inversion layer. But it gets to that point in the first place because of, of the uh, sustenance of the buoyancy by the latent heat release as it goes up. And, and, and in addition to that, that initial sustenance by the latent heat release, once it gets above the freezing level at whatever point it glaciates, there's additional latent heat release that helps it maintain buoyancy in, in the ice phase. So uh, yeah, so those are something to think about, what, what we can do. There's another thing about these clouds that makes them a little bit dicier in that, that this temperature structure isn't the only thing that, that happens to them. These are, these are highly turbulent phenomena, and so at the boundary between where the cloud's going up through the atmosphere and the surrounding atmosphere, there are a lot of turbulent eddies happening, and the turbulent eddies are taking some of the air from outside the cloud, which is drier and cooler, and mixing or entraining it into the cloud itself. Now, if you take dry, cool air and mix it into a warm, moist bubble, you are going to evaporate some of the liquid water that's in, that's in the, the cloud parcel. You're going to reduce the buoyancy of the cloud parcel, and so it's not going to penetrate as high as it does before. And so here are some of uh, so this is more uh, CloudSat Calypso satellite data from the warm pool of the equatorial region, that is the equatorial region going from the Indian Ocean to the maritime continent out over the West Pacific Ocean, which is basically the warmest, wettest place consistently on the face of the Earth and where a lot of the world's deep convective storms and tremendous rainfall uh, occurs. And uh, what this is is a plot of how high the convective clops convective cloud tops go as a function of how much water vapor is in the atmosphere integrating from top to bottom, a total column amount of water vapor in terms of how many millimeters of water you'd get if you precipitated it all out. Well, when the troposphere is dry, even though the sea surface temperatures are very warm, uh, the convection doesn't go high at all. As the amount of water in the atmosphere becomes higher and higher, the convection goes higher, and by the time you get to this amount, the convection can go extremely high. So you actually have to know the temperature profile, and you have to know whether the, the atmosphere around you is relatively dry or relatively moist to know whether you're going to get that. So that's another compli little complicating factor. And these things, by the way, you, know, you all hear about 3D general circulation models and the problems they have predicting certain types of things. Some of these things like this that I'm tell you, telling you are the bane of climate models and, and are one good reason why a lot of these models give different predictions is because we're, we're still in our infancy trying to, to incorporate these, these basic physical ideas into, into our heating. So this is a purely speculative uh, diagram uh, trying to figure out uh, something that has been in the back of my mind for a while is when are you going to find a, a planet with openings in the clouds and when are you going to find a planet that is completely covered by clouds, um, which presumably is important to you. So, so I thought two questions, you know, I don't consider this the last word. It's, a specu it, it's maybe a conversation starter. Maybe that's the way to, 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 to consider it. And, and two things I think that are worth asking is are you looking at a planet that's driven by differential stellar heating? That is to say, on a planet like the Earth, heated more at the equator than it is at the poles. So you have to drive these weather systems with overturning circulations, with air going up and air going down. Okay. Or is it not driven by stellar heating, like, for example, the Jovian planets in our solar system, which are, yes, they are heated by the sun, but they're so far away from the sun that they look at the sun and say, I don't care. And uh, what, they, what they care about is the internal heat source, which is, which is driving their motions. And, and they don't necessarily have the same 
types of response to the heating as a planet that's differentially heated. They seem to be more, more occupied in a lot of places by relatively gentle but widespread turbulence in particular latitude bands. And yes, they have holes in the clouds. You can see at five microns that there's some, some places on Jupiter where there are definite holes in the clouds. But these planets are, are largely uh, cloud covered. And so maybe a planet like that that's heated from below is going to be more likely to have overcast skies than a planet that's, that's heating is mainly by the sun. And likewise, there are some planets that will have a lot of moist convection and some planets that may not have any or have very little. And, uh, and I think probably the more moist convection you have, the better the odds that you're going to have clearings in the clouds adjacent to where the convection is. So I think that's a, you know, this is just a, again, this is a discussion starter that I'd like to see over time as we study more and more, more planets whether there are any general rules we can develop about which types of clouds are going to confound our attempts to see beneath the clouds and, and see the surface or at least to be able to detect gases beneath, uh, beneath the highest clouds. Yes, yes, that's, that would be the other example for you hot Jupiter people that presumably there's going to be something different. Naturally, you have, you have the extreme example of your perfect exoplanet that has no clouds at all, <laughs> right? Okay, but if, but if let's say if we're down at a more modest temperature maybe where you've got clouds on the day side and something different is happening on the night side, whatever that is, then that could be, yeah, yeah, right. So, so that's the type of thing that could occur. And as you put clouds more into, into your hot Jupiter models, predictive clouds into those models, not specifying them, but actually try, trying to make them form their own clouds. It will be interesting to see what types of, of cloud structures you get from that. And will you actually get, get, depths, get gaps in the clouds? And will that be a function of how hot the planet is? Or, or is this just completely garbage, that, that diagram? You know? but, if that, if, but if that diagram is garbage, hopefully there's another diagram that replaces it that's not garbage. So just throw that out there as, as to just, I think it's a good idea to get us all thinking about what types of planets do we expect to have lots of clouds and what types of planets do we expect to have patchy clouds. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say is uh, about the Earth is that uh, other than detecting clouds, clouds affect the climate. And uh, in Earth science, we have this concept called cloud forcing that tells us how much they're affecting the climate. So basically you measure the, uh, the actual amount of sunlight that's being absorbed by the planet. And then you try in observations, you try to find an adjacent region that is not cloudy and you try to see how much sunlight is absorbed there and you look at the difference between the two and that's the effect of clouds. In a GCM, we can do that artificially by running the radiation twice, once offline where we take away the clouds and once inline where we're actually letting the clouds affect the model. And then you can do the same thing for the thermal flux being emitted to space. And so the difference between the actual absorbed sunlight or emitted thermal flux and the absorbed uh, sunlight or emitted thermal flux without clouds is called the cloud forcing. So here's what the Earth would look like in terms of absorbed solar flux if there were no clouds. Not surprisingly, in the absence of clouds, uh, there'd be a lot of absorption of sunlight at the equator and it would drop off approximately as sine theta or cosine theta as you, as you go toward the pole with some interruptions for surfaces of different albedos. But mostly it's just a cosine theta uh, dependence of how the sunlight is falling. Likewise, the thermal radiation emitted to space first and foremost would just be a, a kind of cosine looking function that would just represent the latitudinal dependence of temperature since the flux emitted to space is sort of a sigma t to the fourth right type, type thing modulated by whatever water vapor is in the atmosphere. But with clouds, you get, you get all of these uh, deviations where the clouds are and globally average, it, it amounts to 47 watts per square meter less radiation absorbed by the Earth with clouds than without clouds, which is going to have a big effect on the Earth's albedo. And here's the one that I think is worth mentioning. In the thermal infrared, we're talking about almost 30 watts per square meter of extra greenhouse effect uh, in, in the atmosphere because of the greenhouse effect of clouds that are at high enough altitude to have much of a greenhouse effect. And I think this is of, of, of interest to this community because we worry a lot about our radiation models for exoplanet uh, uh, simulations and trying to get the gaseous radiation as accurate as we can. But in a lot of our calculations, we ignore this thermal effect of the clouds and it's tens of watts per square meter. So 
we're ex ignoring something that is consequential when we ignore that. Okay, move on to Venus. Venus is not a planet that looks like the Earth. Um, it's covered by something. And then the question is, what is it? And, and, and for as long as people have, I think, known about Venus and been able to look at it through a telescope, people have realized it's bright and referred to this as the clouds of Venus. And one interesting question is, is this a cloud? Going back to my initial definitions of clouds versus hazes. What are we looking at there and where did it come from? Uh, here is a cautionary tale for those of you trying to figure out clouds on exoplanets. In the early days, talking the 1960s, um, uh, people used to think that Venus was bright because there were water clouds in the atmosphere and that the things that we were actually seeing were ice clouds. And there were, there were a number of publications trying to make the case that what you saw on Venus uh, were, were ice clouds. And, uh, and so here's one from the Journal of Geophysical Research. If you pull out your September 1st, 1965 <laughs> issue, which I know you have in your bookcase, uh, then, uh, then you can find this article and, and they did this looks familiar, right, to some of you. You have, you have some spectrum of, of some uh, material, and then you have an observed spectrum, and you say, hey, wow, the wiggles look pretty much the same. This is a pretty good fit. I think I, think I know what this is. And so they did this, and they concluded that the Venus clouds are composed of ice crystals, and they also concluded that the actual surface temperature of Venus may well be tolerably low. There were... <laughs> I only picked this paper out because I could find it on, online. There are other papers by Sagan and Pollock uh, also arguing for ice clouds. Plenty of papers, too. The interesting thing, there had already been uh, I, one spacecraft mission that had flown by Venus by the time this work was done, Mariner 2, which measured this huge mic uh, microwave brightness temperature, which, of course, is coming from the lower atmosphere of Venus. And, and so people will do what people do. They say, well, this looks, this looks like what I think should happen. And so what do I do about this high microwave brightness temperature? And I say, well, let me cook up some other story that will explain that. And they imagine that there were, was bremsstrahlung radiation in the ionosphere that was producing these things. It had nothing to do with, with it being hot at the bottom. But... Uh, you know, sooner or later, people then started to uh, started to come up with different ideas. This is a figure from a paper by Hansen and Hovenier in 1974 using polarimetry, ground-based polarimetry, to look at Venus as a function of, of phase angle, which is the supplementary angle from the scattering angle, which Mark Marley showed you uh, plots of this morning. And so they're looking at the percent polarization as a function of phase angle. And... Uh, and so the, the X's are the observations, and these are, are curves for different assumptions uh, for spheres, first of all, uh, for which you can do me scattering, which Mark talked about earlier today, and for different refractive indices. And this feature here, Daphne is here now, right? Uh, so da am I correct that this is the rainbow feature? It's not what we normally call. Okay, okay. And is it evidence for spherical? Yeah. Okay, okay. So that's one important thing because people worrying about ice crystals versus spherical particles. A spherical particle will make certain types of features that Mark was talking about depending on how the radiation passes through the droplet and how, how many times it gets refracted and internally reflected and things like that. And so there are characteristics of liquid particles that are different for, for ice crystals and there are differences according to what you assume about the refractive index. And Hansen and Hovenier, and there were a bunch of other papers doing the same type of work at the same time uh, that said, well, this does not seem to be consistent with water. But uh, eventually people concluded that it was consistent with a hydrated solution of sulfuric acid. And I, I think, I believe today people still think that that is the, the, the basic explanation for what we're seeing on Venus. And we also had direct measurements of the particles in the Venus cloud layers from probes that entered Venus's atmosphere. These are from the Pioneer Venus four probes that entered the atmosphere in 1978. And here's another one from Venera 9 showing the existence. And this is, these are nephilometer uh, results where basically there's a light source in, the, in, the, in this instrument, the probe. There's a light source shining on the air that comes into the probe. And then there's a detector on the other side. And so they can, can look at the thing 
systems that are intercepting the light source and figure out what they're seeing. And so what they, whoops, excuse me, what they saw was three different cloud layers, an upper cloud, a middle cloud, and a lower cloud. And you can see there's variability in location. Uh, but this basic idea that there are these three cloud layers seems to have survived to, to uh, today. Different particle sizes, I'm not going to uh, go into that in any detail, so-called mode one, mode two, and mode three. Some people wonder whether mode three is real or whether it was an artifact of the measurement or not. Uh, I think you can find both sides of, both, both points of view today in the literature. Uh, so what's this, what is this stuff? Well, there have been a number of people wondering about how you make these things on, on Venus. And, uh, and the prevailing notion is that this upper cloud layer is formed by photochemistry. And so you have ultraviolet radiation breaking up some molecule. And depending on which paper you read, it, you, people use different molecules. This one particular one uses carbon dioxide to make a free oxygen. The free oxygen combines with SO2 to make SO3. And SO3 combines with water to make these hydrated sulfuric acid. Uh, droplets. So we would call this stuff, and this stuff by itself is optically thick enough to, to scatter most of the incoming sunlight. So we would say that what you're seeing in a picture of Venus is mostly a haze and that maybe you shouldn't be calling it the Venus clouds, but the Venus haze. Um, and then you have these other middle and lower clouds and how do they form? Well, I don't know that we know as much about those, but the story that has evolved over time and, uh, that many people seem to sign on to is the idea that the droplets formed in the photochemistry in the upper cloud gradually sediment out of the cloud until it gets below the lowest cloud into the lower troposphere where the air is warm enough for these to actually evaporate and enhance the concentration of sulfuric acid gas. And then when you have updrafts that come around, the updrafts lift this to its saturation level and condense that uh, sulfuric acid out again. And so you would argue that maybe this, by my definition, is a cloud, not a haze, because it's not formed directly by the photochemistry. It's formed directly by lifting an adiabatic cooling of the clouds. And the, then the difference between the middle and the lower cloud is a matter of the stability of the atmosphere, which I won't go to into in any detail. So I think we maybe there's still more work to be done to determine whether that's true or not, but that seems to be the prevailing view. One thing we do know about these middle and lower clouds is that they look different from the upper clouds. Venus at, at the upper levels is relatively featureless, but when you look at Venus at 2.26 micron, a couple of other wavelengths where there is radiation escaping, uh, uh, and this is this is thermal radiation escaping from the lower atmosphere, then there's lots of it coming out from some places and not much from other places. And so there are apparently holes in these middle and lower clouds, which certainly suggest the idea that the middle and lower cloud layers, unlike the, the upper haze layer, are dynamically uh, active and that there are upwelling places making clouds and downwelling places getting getting rid of clouds and so on. So the lower atmosphere of Venus looks like a pretty interesting place and too bad we don't uh, explore it more, but it's a tough place to explore. Uh, going back to the upper uh, cloud, the other feature of the Venus clouds that people have talked about for years is the so-called mysterious UV absorber. So if you look at Venus in the ultraviolet rather than the visible, all of these features show up and people have have made a living over the years of trying to come up with ideas for what's causing this ultraviolet uh, absorption. Sulfur dioxide certainly does some absorption, but it doesn't have the right wavelength range to explain everything. There are a ton of papers on various allotropes of, of, uh, of sulfur in the literature. A recent one that came out is S2O and S2O2. And I think, Pat, are you, you're a co-author on this paper, right? Okay. Uh, and then there's Krasnopolsky, who likes I ferrous chloride and uh, formed down deep where the temperature is getting high, starting to starting to approach some of the temperatures that all of you who care about the big planets uh, care about. And he seems to love this, and he writes kind of a paper every year testing some, some other constituent of the Venus clouds, but he seems to really like ferrous chloride. Uh, anyway, uh, the other interesting thing about the Venus clouds that, that, that uh, yeah, I think is, is potentially really fascinating is that we can measure the sulfur dioxide above the cloud tops and it's time variable. So when we got to Venus in 1978 with Pioneer Venus, it was about 400 ppb 
by volume of SO2 measured there by the ultraviolet instrument. And then over time, Pioneer Venus was an orbiter mission in addition to the probe. Over time, the SO2 concentration dropped dramatically, which is really interesting. And Larry Esposito suggested that uh, maybe there's active volcanism on Venus, and we happened to arrive at Venus just after an active volcanic event that injected SO2 into the atmosphere. Unfortunately, from 1995 on, we didn't do any visiting of Venus at all. We have no idea what happened, but then Venus Express went back there in 2006, and at the beginning, they saw these low levels just like had been seen late in the Pioneer Venus mission, and then all of a sudden, it jumped up again, and now, and then after that, it declined again, and so you have what looks like these episodic SO2 injections, why are they happening? Uh, it'd be neat to think that there's volcanism still going on on Venus, putting this into the atmosphere. Other people say you might be able to cook up dynamical mechanisms where the, the atmospheric circulation just sneezes every now and then, and you have a, a major injection just from, from transport uh, into the atmosphere. We don't know. People would love to try to detect active volcanism on Venus to see whether that's true. Uh, do we have any precedent for that in the solar system? Yes, we do. We happen to live on a planet that does this. So we know that we do have volcanic eruptions every once, once in a while that put lots of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. This is El Chichon in 1982. This is Pinatubo in 1991. And we get exactly the same types of things that happen uh, that maybe are happening on Venus. We don't know. And, and one question you can think about, you know, well, if we have this happen, why, don't, why aren't we covered by an op opaque haze? Why doesn't the Earth look like Venus if we have all this SO2 going up into the stratosphere making sulfuric acid droplets? And, and on our planet, I think we know the answer. They go into the stratosphere, but it takes them about two, three years to sediment out into the troposphere. And once they hit the troposphere, then the storms get them and just wash them out of the atmosphere, and, and that's that. And, and uh, the atmosphere gets clean again. Venus does not have that kind of removal mechanism. It just seems to have recycling mechanisms at best. And so we don't know what's going on, but it would be neat to know whether there's something we can learn about exoplanets by thinking about that difference. Okay, I'm going to skip this and then just move to the end of this. And uh, I'll just leave that up instead of going on any longer. Uh, not that, not that I know of. So, I did some work very early in my career, uh, and my colleague Bill Rosso tracking the winds on Venus to first of all establish the magnitude and spatial pattern of the super rotation, and then because it was an orbiter mission, we got to watch it in time, and it seemed to fluctuate on a time scale of about five, six years. But then it it would go down and then it would come up. And there were, I in these ultraviolet images where you could see these patterns, you could, you could detect planetary scale waves like Kelvin waves, things like that, that were propagating through the atmosphere. And, uh, and those seemed to, to come and go. And the, the acceleration and deceleration of the wind seemed to be correlated with that. And so we suggested that something was happening down deeper that was causing the ability of these waves to propagate upward to change in time. And that as that ability to propagate upward changed in time, uh, that that might have then affected exactly how strong the super rotation was. It's always there, but it's a matter of whether it's 95 meters per second or 85 meters per second or something like that. And I think that's still an outstanding question for Venus. But the super rotation seems to always be there. Every other mission that's gone to Venus has still seen it. Uh, oh, I 
I don't know. And right, 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 right. So, so you're so as I understand it, the and and if you I, and if I were to show you three different papers, they would all have different sets of reactions leading sort of to that final result. And so my understanding is that you, th at first you produce a supersaturated sulfuric acid vapor, mm -hmm. which then forms a sulfuric acid droplet itself, and then water molecules in the vicinity glom onto that and sulfuric acid dissolves into it. So I don't know how you would classify that. That's, that's the way I hear it described in the literature. Or backwards. Can't remember. Yeah, so this is the other. Yeah. Ah, I lost everything. Oh, that's why. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. You want the UV one? Increasing the the SO2? Right. And the brightening of the poles? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, I guess, and I'm, so it's the first time I'm thinking about that, but I guess if you increase the SO2, the SO2 you in can increase the production of H2SO4. And then, and then, but then the other question is, what do you think the UV absorber is? And where do you think the UV absorber is being produced? And so does that get into the chemistry that your question sort of leads into and, and, and does that then help explain that? And I don't know the answer to that. Well, you know, there's the collar region where you, we definitely don't see much of it. And then, and then there's something at, at higher latitudes where maybe you do see some of it. So, so, go, so first of all, this goes right. This goes back to the question of why the SO2 is there in the in the first place. So Venus, so we know so little about Venus because we haven't been there very much, and uh, and it's very hard to to obs do observing of the of the lower atmosphere in the surface. Um, but there is geologic evidence from Magellan and a couple of other uh, instruments, I guess, from Venus Express observing the the surface that that something interesting happened in Venus's history 500 million years ago 700 million years ago 800 million years ago and maybe not immediately but just maybe over a period of time that seems to have volcanically surf resurfaced the entire planet and uh, and and we hope that maybe there are still a few regions on Venus the so-called tessera regions which are a little higher than other regions that might actually preserve some of the old terrain and might give us some clues about what Venus was like in the past, uh, but we have to send a mission there and be able to observe these these things in order in order to know. Right now it's just modeled and speculation by people. So depending on what you think is the reason why that happened and why it looks the way it does today and why the sulfuric acid haze persists, um, you know, David Grinspoon and Mark Bullock ran a series of, of 1D models about a decade or two ago, and they can make a haze that that I think you now sort of persists over time. But depending on what you think that story is, th this may be 
is this is this the end state for Venus or is this just a transitory phase and something else will happen later on? I absolutely believe that there would be other planets like this out there. I wonder whether there are some other Venus-like planets that managed to escape this fate, whether because of luck or because of just slightly more favorable conditions where they formed or or a different interior evolution of the of the planet and so on. And there are so many of these questions that we we don't have any clue about for, for Venus. We think about how we struggle to understand the evolution of Mars' climate, but we know so much more about Mars than we know about Venus at this standpoint. And actually, one of my last bullets is, you know, I'd really love to see us observe some exo-Venuses and not just worry about planets that are kind of definitively within the habitable zone. I'd love to see a couple of exo-Venuses so that we start to at least have some small number statistics to, to answer the question that you're talking about. Yes, it would. So the, I mean, these features would look a lot like Earth and if Venus rotated slowly from the beginning of its history, some people have published papers uh, suggesting that, that its whole history could have conceivably been different.
I saw it and I was and I was wondering whether to put it in my talk and I decided and then I read something that I thought was a little critical of it. Yes, I after that they and I said, well, maybe I don't know enough about this to be saying anything about it, but I'm aware of the thing that, that you talked about. Do I have this on me? Okay. So could I remember uh, remind everyone to put down your name? Maybe I'm just circulating it now. Yeah. So you start, please. So let's see. Well, uh, preferably your name. Do we see it here? I'm not. Are you seeing it? Oh, Daniel? he has a pen. Good. He's circulating his pen. That's good. Are you, are you seeing your drive here? You don't see it. It should, it should actually pop up. Yeah. There it is. You want the PDF or the PowerPoint? Okay. I'll ask you whether you are there in person for Friday for lunch. If you are there, you put it across to the table. If you want a box lunch, you have two choices, either you want it in the morning or after 10 o'clock, okay? So it's, the point is, if you want So this activity is much less ambitious than, uh, than the previous ones. I I'm not going to have you run a GCM. And uh, how, oh, okay, you have to. Is that going to do it? Or do I have to do something else? as to how I came into this. Yes. Let's see. Okay, and I think I moved that over to your stick, and I, I have to eject your, did I have, do I have to eject your stick, or did you eject it already? Okay. Okay, so, so this is uh, this is more of a conceptual 
exercise uh, than anything computational. Um, we did all the computations for you. We ran the GCM or GCM for a bunch of planets. And a uh, question that I was interested in that, that I was inspired to think about by reading exoplanet uh, detection papers. And every time uh, an exoplanet is discovered, a rocky exo or what or what might be a rocky exoplanet um, is discovered, then um, of course the people will will always uh, give you the parameters that they can measure about the star and about the planet, and then they have to decide whether they're going to get your attention by saying this planet looks like it's in the habitable zone or this planet looks like a temperate planet or something like that, and of course they don't actually have that information, and so. They take what little they know about the planet and they'll try to create an equilibrium temperature. And in order to, to uh, create an equilibrium temperature, then you have to know something about the albedo. And the Earth has an albedo of about 0.3. Oh, and by the way, the albedo that, uh, so as, as Mark was alluding to earlier today, there are different albedos around. We're not talking geometric albedo here. We're talking about what you all call the bond albedo which is actually the integrated over wavelength, the, uh, the, the uh, total fraction of the incident starlight that gets reflected about the planet and its, sig its significance is in terms of, of uh, the energy balance at the top of the atmosphere so that in case you're you're uh, wondering this is this is the starlight absorbed by the planet and
Okay, should we maybe wrap it up and just talk about it a little bit? Um, I don't know. I, I, do you want to do you want to try to make some guesses first, and then I'll put up the answers and. Uh, and so we have about we have about 15, 20 minutes left. So, if anybody. <laughs> should I? Do you want me to just talk to you about which which planet is which? To guess, okay. All right. So if somebody wants wants to guess at any planet, then just tell me which one you want to guess at. So these, so these are, yeah, these are, I should make this bigger. Okay, so, so people want that one to be Cretaceous, but do you want it to be something else? A is, so, we, so we're going to have some, so we're going to have some disagreements. Huh? Maybe we should just go to the answers. I don't know, because we have, some, we have some, some conflict of opinion. OK. OK. So, so, so. So if you so if you want me to go why go about go uh, along about why why these are what they are, so the reason that that planet A is the is the Huronian snowball Earth, uh, I guess that well there's there's a couple of couple of gives giveaways, uh, one is that the albedos are very high. Remember the albe the, the reds are high albedos, so you can see that's a planet that's high albedo in most places. As is planet B, which is Archean case A, and that's also basically a snowball uh, planet. It's got a, a different, uh, no, it's got the same continental arrangement actually as, uh, no, it doesn't. This Archean case A actually had modern Earth continents, even the real Archeans probably didn't have modern Earth continents. But that has modern Earth continents, and you can see a little bit of that uh, because the map is centered in the Pacific, and you can sort of see the blue areas being Asia and Western North America. Um, you can't see that so much in the, in the Huronian uh, snowball Earth, which has more of an, an equatorial supercontinent. Uh, I should say before I leave those that, that I decided to bear some of our dirty laundry. Uh, all of you who don't run GCMs always want to know what's wrong with GCMs. And one of the things we found out that's <coughs> wrong with our GCM, which was not designed to do extreme climates, but it has a dynamic ocean with a section of sea ice. And what we found out is that when you create so much sea ice that you, you paint the advecting sea ice into a corner, namely at the 